Hello and welcome to this lesson on the decay constant, which is part of the nuclear physics topic in AQA A-level physics. So in today's lesson, we're going to try and explain the nature of radioactive decay and understand this concept of the decay constant. So if we are successful and we learn in today's lesson, you should be able to define exponential decay in terms of radioactive decay, explain why radioactive decay is a random process, and then define and calculate the decay constant of the nuclear decay. So in today's lesson we're going to be covering the following part of the specification 3.8.1.3 radioactive decay so exponential behavior in physics is actually very common and it appears in the physics a level specification several times now examples of this include the discharge of an electrical charge on a capacitor whose plates are connected via a resistor the reduction in amplitude of a damped simple harmonic oscillator the absorption of electromagnetic radiation passing through matter so for example gamma rays through lead uh, the New newton's law of coulomb and then finally the radioactive decay of the decay of unstable nuclei by the principle of half-life. So exponential behaviour can be proven if the constant found in the equation is the same whenever values are inputted into the equation. So we can prove this if the y value is expressed as 1 over the square root value and a straight line can be drawn from our experimental data. Now in most cases exponential behaviour is observed as radiation and particles spread out via a sphere and the surface area of the sphere is 4 pi r squared so given a constant Rate of change the exponential behavior but another way in which we can observe exponential behavior which isn't linked to the idea of particles and radiation spreading throughout a sphere is in radioactive decay so radioactive decay is the process of a nucleus changing in composition to increase stability so radioactive decay will involve the increased instability of the nucleus and it can lead to the emission of either alpha beta or gamma radiation now this increase in stability is due to an increase in the comparative strength of the strong force because an unstable nucleus has the electromagnetic and strong interactions as similar sizes in this nucleus whilst a stable nucleus has a strong interaction much more dominant than the electromagnetic interaction now it's impossible to measure if an individual nucleus will decay in in this process because it is random however we can measure the time it takes on average for an unstable nucleus to decay and this is linked to a quantity called half-life now the half-life of a radioactive isotope is the average time it takes for either the mass of the radioisotope to drop to half its original mass, the count rate of the radioisotope in a sample to fall to half its initial value, or for the activity of the radioisotope in a sample to fall to half its initial value. Now in practice, half-life is not measured by counting nuclei, but by measuring the time it takes for the activity to half. So for example, if the count rate is 600 counts per minute and it takes 30 minutes to go to 300 counts per minute, that's the half-life 30 minutes, so it will take a further 30 minutes to go to 150 counts per minute. Now it's important that we always state that the half-life is the average time for the mass to half, the count rate to half, or the activity to half, because radioactive decay is a random event. So for a substance, we could measure how many radioactive nuclei there are, and over time the radioactive nuclei nuclei will become non-radioactive via radioactive decay. So over time, more and more non-radioactive nuclei are produced via this decay. Now, there are more produced at the start and fewer produced over time because this is exponential decay. Now, it's important that radioactive decay is a random and spontaneous event. So it means that the individual behavior of a nucleus can be predicted, nor could it be influenced. Now, the chance of decay remains constant, which is why decay slows okay, over time because there are less radioactive nuclei to actually then become non-radioactive and the chance of each one decaying is constant so the number of nuclei decaying becomes less okay with each time but the time it takes to half remains the same so for half-life is the same for each half and of the number of radioactive nuclei count rate or um, activity so it's important to note that because that's the chance of decay happening is the same all the way through the process regardless of how many there are we've got the idea of half-life so it's important to note that it is you know it's a fixed value and it's common it's common throughout how many however the k's are because it is the, the 
the chance of decay happening is the same each time. Now we can have a more mathematical approach determining the, the mass of a radioactive isotope or the activity or the count rate after a certain number of half-lives. So if we consider a sample of radioactive isotope R which starts off with 100 grams of radioactive nuclei, after one half-life the mass remains will be 50 grams, after two half-lives it'll be 25 grams, after three half-lives it'll be 12.5 grams, each time it's halving in size so therefore we can use this idea to calculate a general formula for working out these values. Now we can do this for mass, we can do this for activity, we can do this for count rate. So what we say is the mass of the radioactive nuclei remaining is equal to 0.5 to the power of number of half-lives times by the initial mass. Now this could be for the count rate or it could also be for the activity. Now as well as working out values with this mathematical equation you can also work out the half-life of a radioactive substance using an, ex using an experiment and forming a graph where you plot the activity or the mass of radioactive nuclei on the y-axis and the time on the x-axis. Now because this is an exponential process because the chance of decay is constant throughout, okay, we'll all, this will always form an exponential decay curve. So what will happen is on these decay curves you draw on the graph two lines where the activity or the count rate or the radioactive mass is one is half of the other. So for example one line where the activity is 200 and the next line where the activity is 100. You then extrapolate these lines downwards and find the corresponding time and the difference in the time is the half-life. So that's a very important idea. So here's an example. So we've got a graph here which shows an exponential decay. Again why is an exponential decay? Because the chance of decay happening for each nucleus is the same and the number of nuclei remaining after a prolonged time gets lower so less will be decaying but the proportion of them decaying will remain constant leading to this exponential decay curve. So you choose the time for one activity and you choose the value. You then extrapolate down and find the time. You then find the time for the activity which has half the value of the first activity. So in this case we've done 8,000 becquerels and we've done 4,000 becquerels. Now the half-life is the time taken between the first activity measured and the second activity measured. So in this case we would say the half-life will be 7 seconds because that's the difference between the two values. Now this would be true if we had the mass of the radioactive isotope on the y-axis or we had the count rate of the, of the sample on the y-axis. Now we would also also advise that you would take the, this value, you would work this value out for a number of different uh, uh, points in your data and then calculate a mean. This again is to minimize the random nature of radioactive decay. So we would note that as the mass of the radioactive isotope or the activity or the count rate decreases with time, the graph is referred to as a decay curve. Now measurements show that the mass decreases exponentially, it, it drops by a constant factor of multiple and equal intervals of time, which is the same for the count rate or the activity. Again, why is that? Because each nucleus has the same chance of decaying. Now, although in theory, the radioactive decay curve will never fall to zero, in practice, the level of radiation falls to a level which is indistinguishable to the background radiation. Now, in previous concepts, when we've looked at radioactive decay, we can consider this on the scale of, of nuclei. So if we consider a sample of radioactive nuclei, we can use what we call a whole scale method. So we can look at not just one nucleus, but it's actually a great number of them. So we can say that radioactive decay follows statistical mechanics. So this is easier to carry out as it's easier to measure the macroscopic behavior in the real world as opposed to just a sample of a very small number of radioactive nuclei, which is why it's easier not to count the number of radioactive nuclei in a sample, but rather to measure the activity or the count rate or the mass. Now, like mentioned before, radioactive decay is completely random. You can't predict individual um, behavior so we can't predict when the atom's nucleus will decay. Now, while you cannot predict the, the decay of an individual nucleus, if you've got a very large number of nuclei, we can look at the overall behavior to show a pattern. So any sample of a particular isotope has the same rate of decay. The same proportion of the atomic nuclei will decay in a given time. So each unstable nucleus within the isotope will have a constant decay probability. So we can then use this idea okay, to then calculate the statistical probability that one nucleus 
calculus would decay in a set time. So like I said before, we should be able to calculate the chance, the probability that how long it would take for a nucleus, one nucleus to decay. So we can think what's the chance that, that this unstable nucleus will decay and become more and become more stable or what's the chance it will stay unstable. So this links to the concept of what we call the decay constant. That's the probability of an individual nucleus decaying and then becoming more stable over a set time. Now we normally state the decay constant in terms of how likely the nucleus is to decay in one second. So this means the higher the decay constant, the faster the rate of decay. So this is also based though on random behavior and probabilities. So to fully understand radioactive decay, we've got to look at the idea of the decay constant. Now the decay constant, which is given the symbol lambda, is the probability or chance that an individual nucleus will decay in a second. Now lambda is used for wavelength as well as the decay constant, but the context that is used in should make it unambiguous. Now the decay constant has units of becquerels or seconds to the minus one. Now we can link in our um, our previous understanding of things like activity and decay constants to give us the following equation. So, because of the activity of a radioactive source is how many decays happen per second, we can combine this with the decay constant and the number of radioactive nuclei present. So we can say activity is equal to lambda times by n, because the probability for each of the n, each of the unstable nuclei, is lambda. Now, a is the activity of the sample, that the number of nuclei that decay every second. Now the decay constant is the constant of proportionality between the activity of the sample A and the number of unstable nuclei N in the sample. So what this tells us is that the higher the decay constant, the greater the chance of the nucleus decaying, so the greater the activity. So the higher the number, but also it tells us the higher the number of particles, the more decays taken place, so therefore the greater the activity. So the decay constant is a measure of how quickly an isotope will decay. So like we said before, radioactivity has the following equation. A is equal to lambda n. However, as time passes, n will get smaller because the number of radioactive nuclei will be decreasing. So A represents a decrease in n. So to make the formula reflect this, it does need a minus sign. So A is equal to minus lambda n. So the more undecayed nuclei you have and the greater probability that an individual one will decay, the greater the activity of the sample. So we can also refer to activity as the rate of disintegration. So the activity of a radioactive source is how many radioactive decays happen every second, which we can also express in terms of differentials. So A is equal to delta N over delta T, and we know that A is equal to minus lambda N. So we can equate those two values. So we can say delta N over delta T, the change in the number of radioactive nuclei in a certain time, is equal to minus lambda N. Now the unit of the decay constant, as mentioned before, is seconds to the minus 1. So a large value of the decay constant means that there's a fast radioactive decay and a short half-life, whilst a small value of the decay constant means there's a slow radioactive decay and a long half-life. So radioactive decay is an iterative process. The number of nuclei that decay in one time period controls the number that are available to decay in the next time period, leading to the equation you can see on the screen. Now we can plot out our decay curves to show the impact of the decay constant. So here, you can see the number of radioactive nuclei n on the y-axis and the time t on the x-axis. Now the red line shows a small decay constant and the blue line shows a large decay constant. Now a small decay constant means there's a small probability of a nucleus decaying. So this will mean the half-life is longer when the decay constant is smaller. So this indicates to us that the half-life and the decay constant are inversely proportional. Whilst the blue line shows a large decay constant and means there's a high probability of decay. So this means that the half-life is shorter when the decay constant is higher. This makes sense because there's a greater chance of decaying, so they'll decay more rapidly, so our half-life takes up a shorter time. Now the half-life and the decay constant are inversely proportional. Now in an incoming, upcoming session, we'll look at the mathematical link between the decay constant and the half-life in addition to the qualitative relationship we've just covered. Now we'll also look at ways in which the decay constant can be derived by mathematical or graphical methods. 
Now this will involve taking logarithmics of values, which was similar to when we looked at this idea in capacitors. So to summarise what we've learned in today's lesson, we can understand what the random nature of radioactive decay is, understand the constant decay probability for a given nucleus, understand the equation that delta n over delta t is equal to minus lambda n and the use of activity is a is equal to lambda n. So if we've been successful, we can define exponential decay in terms of radioactive decay. We can explain why a radioactive decay is a random process and we can define and calculate the decay constant of nuclear decay. So I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson on the decay constant, which is part of the nuclear physics topic in AQA A-level physics. Thank you very much for listening and have a lovely day.